it's uh, it's really good to be here. I'm I'm uh, really pleased to have the opportunity. Um, so going from where Brandon was, which was you know the functions of the services like the current top of the tier of the tree, in terms of the stack levels, uh, we're going to go down quite a few layers here, down to the infrastructure and into the underworld beneath the infrastructure as well. So, so it's going to be quite a big adjustment, a bit like going out of that window perhaps and coming down to the ground floor, but uh, uh, hopefully we'll manage. So what I wanted to talk about is this sort of quiet revolution that has been going on for the last five or six years. And it's, it's about this sort of some radical new ways in which science, big scale science is being performed today. Um, there's new scientific instruments uh, in existence and being made and being planned, which have been made possible by the kind of the transformations that um, scientists have available when they can harness new models of compute power. And in a smaller way, uh, including Wales, we're going to talk about how our region and our industry is, is really working at, at, at the forefront of that transformation. So there's no reason why we have to assume that this is all just something that happens somewhere else. This is being made here and across the narrow sea in Bristol as well. I, I'm looking forward to that as well. So, uh, um, but before we go too far, everyone knows what OpenStack is? First word, yeah? Is it, as you're often familiar? It's kind of like the Linux of AWS, really. It's the build-it-yourself um, private cloud. And uh, I mean, my father he built his own car. He drove it for 20 years. Um, why can't we build our own clouds? I mean, who's to stop us? It's just, you know, it's just cloud. It's just kit. It's just tin. So uh, this is me. I have been the CTO of um, Stack HPC. Uh, we are a small startup in the town across the water. Uh, we're building up expertise in this area of how do you do high performance computing, uh, cloud computing, data intensive analytics, how do you bring all of that together in a way which doesn't suck? So, so that's the, the main key thing is, is how do we retain the best bits of cloud flexibility and the best bits of performance without compromising each other too much? And there's, there's a whole sort of spectrum of, um, of trade-offs there. Um, you won't have heard of us, we're, we're only 10 people. Um, you wouldn't have heard of us unless we work in our sector, and you'll be probably be lucky to have heard of us even then. Um, I first met uh, John, my co-founder, in 1992, when I was 17. And I have worked with uh, John, the co-founder, in every single one of these companies since then. Oh, apart from Cray, actually. He, yeah, he went somewhere else for that bit. Um, the, the picture is um, Adam and Eve on Trifam in uh, Snowdonia. If you're ever looking for a nice sort of visual metaphor for changing jobs or, um, or uh, you know, some sort of uh, going into a startup. Perfect, apart from maybe just airbrush out the other pillar because it looks far too, far too concrete, really. But um, it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a necky, airy experience. I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend doing it once. Um, so we're going um, gonna to lay the scene with something which... Um, I've had nothing to do with. I've met some people who have worked on this, but this is awesomely cool. Uh, so this is a, we're gonna take a little step back. Uh, this is the dawn of a whole new branch of experimental physics. So everything that we perceive in the universe, we perceive through light, radiation, electromagnetic waves, things like that. We, this is a whole new way of seeing the universe. This is LIGO, so this is the, um, the gravity uh, machine, so it can hear gravity waves. And what it is, is um, it's a very long vacuum tube. It's four kilometers long. And then at the other end of that, there is another four kilometer long tube on a right angle. And in between the two, there's a mirror. And what it is, is it takes laser light, which shines down the tube, and, um, and then it reflects and shines back again. And they measure very slight perturbations in the, in the, um, in the interference between the two laser beams and use that to infer that whether the tube is expanding or contracting. And there's one of these in one corner of the United States, and there's another one in the far corner of the United States, and they kind of join together how they're both wobbling in order to perceive the passage of a gravity wave through the planet. And this machine was, is testament to 
40 years of belief and perseverance and sheer determination by a group of scientists, uh, Kip Thorne and a bunch of other people, who, who put it together. And it had been running for uh, two weeks, three weeks, and they saw or captured their first evidence of a gravity wave event. Now, it looks pretty special, and it is an absolutely enormous investment in terms of a scientific in instrument, but it can only detect the very largest gravity events in the universe. So what it's tuned to detect is the spinning together and eventual coll collision of two black holes. And this happened two weeks after it started. So that was pretty lucky, I think. Um, the physics of black holes and that kind of cosmology uh, is mind-boggling. So the two black holes they, they calculated from what they, what they detected were the size of 36 suns and 29 suns. And when they went together, they made a big bang. So this is the biggest bang that humankind has ever had the misfortune to make. A 50 megaton hydrogen bomb is, if you measure it in the matter equivalent of the energy that is generated, it's a couple of kilograms. So when these two black holes collided, they gave off three solar masses of energy, the equivalence of that. For a tenth of a second, it was brighter, more energetic, than everything else in the universe put together. And no one saw it. We didn't know. We would not have known, except that we created and commissioned LIGO uh, two weeks before it started, before we, it happened. And then LIGO only detected it because it moved by a thousandth of the width of an atomic radius, a nuclear radius. So that was pretty special. That's a pretty cool machine. And... Um, but it's got, a, it's got this bit of a problem that it's not very sensitive. And it's also a, only able to detect really sort of the high end of gravity waves. Because they can get big. They can get really big. They can get as big as the solar system in terms of the sort of um, the wavelength, the rippling that they do. So we're going to talk about another machine, which is getting closer to where I'm going. And that machine is able to detect gravity waves in a whole different way. It doesn't have this problem. So uh, uh, you might be wondering why Einstein's blowing smoke rings out of his ear. But um, <laughs> this is actually meant to be a kind of a conceptual depiction of one of the side effects of relativity, which is, which is gravity waves. And um, so how do we detect a wave which has the wavelength of the entire solar system? So what they do, what they're proposing to do, is to use one of the wonders of deep space to catch another one. And how they're going to do this is use a pulse, periodic pulse, with very, very accurate um, periodicity. And if we build up a network of these pulsars across the universe, then effectively they're like the tubes that the, of LIGO, only they are billions of light years long. And then we can use that in order to detect these giant waves that are going through the solar system uh, much more effectively. That, that, that is the theory. So this thing does not exist yet, but it is about to get made. So the square kilometer array is the machine that is going to do this pulsar timing and is going to be looking for evidence of far bigger gravity waves than we can perceive at the moment. This is a network of radio telescopes. And it's going to be the biggest telescope, the biggest, most sensitive telescope in the world when it is built in the early 2020s. So radio telescopes, we, we all know what they look like. What you might not realize is that radio astronomy is about astonishingly faint signals. Astonishingly faint. So in the 80s, Carl Sagan said that um, all the energy that's ever been received from outside the solar system by all the radio telescopes in the world is the equivalent of a snowflake hitting the ground. The whole sum of everything. Uh, so these dishes are astonishingly sensitive, but they're also over, you know, they're completely deluged in noise. You know, the, the noise that they get is millions and millions of times more powerful than the signals that they're trying to perceive. So 
this is actually a huge data analytics problem, a huge problem of correlating the data and bringing it together, focusing it to form beams into the sky where we can actually perceive outside of the noise of the microwave ovens and the radio, mobile phones and the other things, everything that is coming from outside of the solar system from across, the, from across space. Uh, these dishes are actually prototypes. That's uh, an experiment on a massive scale. So the SKA is big. It's really, really big. Um, it's actually two distinct instruments. We have uh, these kind of Christmas tree-like antennae in the desert in Australia. So they're, they're both very remote. And we have more conventional uh, mid-frequency satellite uh, uh, parabolic dishes in the desert in South Africa. Each of them generates uh, 700 and something gigabytes a second of data. That's a lot of data. I mean, that's probably more than algorithmia takes in. It's a lot of data. How do we deal with this? It comes through the, from the desert in 70 odd 100 gigabit fiber links. And it has to be consumed. It is continual stream. And so it has to be consumed by a couple of extraordinarily big computers. So the machines that they're talking about have um, um, a very large sort of flash buffer, which is these um, 38, 32 petabytes of data. Um, so that has to be able to hold stream, buffer, and process the data for about six hours. In order to do that, they need um, machines that are about as big as the biggest machine in the United States or in the world today. And we need two of those. Luckily, this is the mid-2020s, so there's a bit of time for everything to get cheaper and uh, more power efficient <laughs> and, and so on. So um, actually, um, it's pretty well doable. I mean, we, we are not far from these numbers uh, today. So we are on the right track. Um, so we're getting back down to where our company comes in and our role in this is a machine which is called the Performance Prototype Platform. So it's called Alaska. Ala SKA. It's a terrible pun. It was my co-founder who made it up. He loves this stuff. I think he, it's his, main, his, his main love is making awful puns for the things that we do. Um, you probably know this from everyone. You know, Everyone's got one in their office. But um, we've been working on this project for about 18 months. And the idea is, how do we... The scientists don't really know how they're going to make the machine to process this stuff. And if they, every time they get it wrong by 1% or so, you know, it's 1% less efficient than it could be. That's like a giant supercomputer's worth of stuff just thrown away. So what we need to be able to do is help them find the best strategies now for what's going to be good in 2024 or so, which is kind of, kind of hard, but we can find the right directions. We can, we can eliminate the turkeys and we can, we can focus on promising paths for future technology. So this, this prototyping phase has just finished. Um, and we're moving now into a kind of a bridging into a pre-production phase. The machine that we made has a bit of everything, uh, or something of many things anyway. Um, so we have a real sort of nice um, heterogeneous technology mix in the system. And we use OpenStack to provide a flexible means of um, helping the scientists and researchers who are using it to provision deployments, assemble deployments, which can bring in together ARM64, InfiniBand network fabrics, 512 gigs of RAM, um, high, um, you know, machines which are, are well stacked with NVMe devices, that kind of stuff. They can actually then compose a multi-node processing model, generate an experiment, run the experiment, and then do it some other way. Uh, so OpenStack, in this case, is helping us to define a little supercomputer, and also doing it in a way which is kind of nice and friendly. So there's like REST APIs, and there's interfaces, and there's command lines, and there's there's web dashboards and other stuff. It kind of fits quite well for this. And but the the really important piece for this project is that it's actually managing bare metal. So when we make a VM, the irony of it is we make a physical machine, which we say to the the user, here's your instance, here's your VM. But it's actually raw, raw iron. There's nothing in there to ac accumulate overhead. There's no fat to trim off the pork chop. So this is actually at the sharp end of a much wider trend in universities, research institutions, and so on, in that they've got this 
whole sort of uh, machine room where they might have a huge high performance computing facility, but then they've got all the other stuff. You know, they've got the data analytics, they've got the construction of models, they've got the post processing of what the main HPC resources generated. They have to build a, a whole sort of infrastructure ecosystem around their large scale systems in order to um, in order to feed them and actually digest what has been generated by them. And so one nice way of doing that in a flexible way is that we can build a private cloud and we can have different uh, virtual machines upon it in very much a similar way that everyone is familiar with. And then we can drop processing platforms on it or we could drop you know, data analytics platforms on it as well. So if we were to just stop with the things that we had before, only recreated a little bit slower and a little bit smaller, we're kind of losing the point of it. And the real advantage here is how do we get um, to run Hadoop one day, Kubernetes another day, Slurm or HPC workloads another day, or kind of a mixture of all three, which is sort of like fighting for the resource and contending for this uh, finite private cloud resource. But actually then, the really cool thing is, what happens when you do it in bare metal? So this is, this is where the action is for us today, is how do we make a cloud which has a dashboard and APIs and other things, and you talk about images and volumes and networks and instances and so on. But when I make an HPC cluster, I write the BIOS configuration of my servers so that they are configured for low latency, high clock speed, straight line speed. And when I'm doing a Hadoop cluster, I take all the, all the disks out of the RAID controller and I present 12 independent disks and I configure the machine for high throughput. So I enable all the logical processes, the hyperthreading and the other things. And I enable a high throughput oriented power profile. How do we do this kind of deep reconfiguration of the machines in our data center just according to whether it's a hint that we want to run HPC, we want to run data analytics, we want to run containers. So this is, this is where the action is in terms of the cutting edge of what OpenStack is capable of today. So we have quite a nice workflow here. And we use Ansible for everything from talking to the BIOSes and figuring out what to do with the RAID controllers and the other things, talking to OpenStack, making the, making the um, bare metal VMs or the virtual machines, and then deploying application stacks on top of them. These might not be familiar. BGFS is a parallel file system. Um, Slurm is the um, conventional HPC, high performance computing job queue. Uh, the monitor lizard is, um, is an OpenStack service called Manaska, in which we can <laughs> gather data that the user is submitting from their applications, couple that with network data, with storage data, with data from the hypervisor about cycles from the, uh, for all the processes and so on, and then present all of those pieces of data in the context of one another in order to understand where the time is going. Because actually, this is something that everyone wants to hide from you. If you buy time on someone else's cloud, they don't want to tell you how slow your machine is running or why. But if you own the cloud and you have a private cloud and you made it yourself, this is exactly what you want to know. And so this is exactly what we try to present. We can see where the cloud is costing us and then try and eliminate that. So um, Ansible drives everything end to end there. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that we've been doing, which kind of takes us on to the next level. So we're talking about um, radio astronomy. Now we're looking at the Euclid satellite. So this is a, a machine that's going to be launched as a pair of um, space observatories. They're going to get launched in the next decade or so. So they're still at the stage where they're saying, well, if we built this thing and, um, and we thought it worked like this, and this is a theory, can we actually make instruments that will be useful? And when the data comes back from those instruments, can we actually make sense of what they're saying? And it's best to do that kind of stuff before you launch it so that you know whether to carry on or not. So the aim of this project is to look for the sort of the lumpiness of space. And so they've got to map the sky and say, oh, it looks awfully clumpy over there. And therefore, the light that's coming from behind there is going to be kind of bent like this. And therefore, they can build a map of the sky without gravitational lensing, or they can use the effects of gravitational lensing to say, there is matter here, which we don't know about. Okay. 
So in order to be able to do this, they wanted to be able to model the kind of things that the, the detector would be seeing and perturb it a little bit for gravitational effects and then work out whether their algorithms, their data, data analytics, could then decompile the, the distortions and, and produce the original model and calculate where the, the sky is being um, perturbed around these uh, sort of bodies of dark matter. To do this, they needed a huge amount of compute capacity. So it was um, 6,000 cores for three months was what they were asking for. And the way that this was delivered was through this um, federation of UK science called IRIS, which is brand new. Uh, it's been in its first year. It's just coming online. And the idea behind IRIS is it's a federation of UK scientific institutions, famous lab laboratories like uh, Rutherford Appleton Labs in Oxfordshire, uh, Manchester University, Cambridge University, Edinburgh University, a whole network of high-profile, prominent research institutions providing, essentially, OpenStack managed compute resources and grid managed compute resources on demand um, dynamically to large projects like this, capable for supporting these big sort of flagship science things which would come along and they would come along with, it's not like um, the kind of the spike around lunchtime, but the spike around November. This is the kind of thing they're planning. You know, they, they, they look ahead and they say, I need cause for this. So what we've done, what we've been working on with this project, is how do we create little software-defined supercomputers in each of these sites and then link them together into a kind of a hybrid cloud, kind of a federated supercomputing environment. They need to have... Um, large amounts of data but but it can actually be kind of loosely coupled across the federation but tightly coupled for scratch space locally to each of the machine each of the sites so the sites we have here edinburgh is where the laboratory is where they, the scientists are working cambridge manchester universities rutherford appleton labs and the idea of this concept is we use ansible and um, other cloud technologies in order to deploy little high-performance computing clusters on OpenStack environments, and then we link them together using these um, uh, VPN message meshes, so uh, federated WANs and so on. We build federated data file systems from site to site uh, using replicating Ceph, and, um, and we can actually manage, so we have the subdirectories which are locally stored here, locally stored there, and so we can actually access local data on each of the sites, and know that it is local, it's data from other sites, uh, or from local resources on site, right, sorry. So the challenge here is we can make these machines, and you, you can use cloud-native stuff to conceive of just about any kind of processing, really. I mean, it's, uh, it's so flexible. So the question is, can you make it fast? And can you make it as fast, or almost as fast, as running without the cloud stuff in the way? and doing the thing on the bare metal. And this was an experiment we did uh, a couple of years ago where we essentially present what happens when you optimize cloud networking and other things in order to, um, in order to get closer to metal performance. So this is just um, iperf run over time. So it's just a TCP benchmark uh, between two VMs, which I had set up not to be running on the same machine. So we're going across the local data center network infrastructure. And we went from a gigabit and a half a second on a 50 gig Ethernet NIC up to 48 gigabits a second. And the way we did that was tuning the BIOS, changing the kernel, um, enabling or disabling hyperthreading, so turning off the logical processes, uh, mapping the physical cores to the virtual CPUs, passing through awareness of the different CPU sockets in the machine. So we have um, uh, NUMA awareness, running IO virtualization, so this is SRIOV, which is this idea of passing through physical network cards into your VMs, and then finally running on the bare metal itself, so ditching KVM, ditching the hypervisor, and just running the thing raw. And what this presents, for anyone who's not seen anything like it, is kind of like a continuum of convenience. So down here we can do everything, we can live migrate, we can do anything we want with the VMs, 
And up here, uh, we can start them and we can kill them and we can change the networking a bit and we can do some stuff. Uh, we use images, but actually we're pretty limited. We've given away a whole load of flexibility. So the performance and the, the trade-off between the two is going to be somewhere around here. And different sites and different applications strike a different balance on how do they make software-defined infrastructure actually be fast infrastructure as well. And generally, it turns out to be kind of a metric that doesn't really exist when we're talking about scientific computing, which is how quickly can I get my scientists to writing their paper? So that takes into account the development time, the setup time, getting into a new environment, actually doing the work, which is the bit that people usually measure, and then getting the results out. And so having software-defined infrastructure, making it look cloud-like, the resources that they're consuming, really cuts down on the startup time and getting to the point where they're productive to the extent where they could sacrifice and run right down the middle here maybe, just because it's a bit more flexible. So there's a trade-off every time. I've got one more little case here. How are we doing for time, by the way? We're good. Uh, five, minutes. <laughs> Time's a bit. Right. I wanted to share one more thing, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, this is the uh, computing facilities at Cambridge University. This is the biggest supercomputer in UK research today. Um, it's 2.2 petaflops, so we'd need about 60 of these in order to do the SKA machine. So it's not that big, but, um, but it is the biggest thing in the UK today. It's bigger than the Cray, for example. But, um, this machine has this piece in it now, the data accelerator. So what it's got is a bunch of specialist compute resources. So it's got the, um, I think it's the biggest GPU machine in the UK, Knight's Landing, and Skylake Xeons. And, um, and it's all backed by this enormous research data storage file system. This piece in the middle is kind of cool because this is huge amounts of NVMe disk, NVMe flash devices. There are 24 nodes. Each of them has 12 large high-spec NVMe devices in them and 200 gigabits of networking. And what they use it for is essentially to create a little high-performance cache tier for any of the jobs that are running over here to create a little cache overlay for the, mission, for the data that's stored back here. Because otherwise, if a giant workload is running over there and it starts to do things all over the file system, everyone else using the file system gets blocked out. You get the noisy neighbor thing, but you have this noisy neighbor, which is like a 1,000 neighbors all being noisy. So, so the data accelerator creates a little miniature file system which just replicates the workspace of the application. And the data, the, 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 the workload talks to that little workspace. And then at the end of the job, the workspace is drained back into the file system. So it creates like a transparent cache of where the work application is working. And the reason this is cool for me um, is that it is made using cloud native tools, etc. D, Python, Ansible, REST, everything that about it is very familiar to anyone who works in the kind of things that we work in here. And that's a first. So there never really has been a strong convergence between this very sort of big iron world of, of high performance computing and the sort of super diverse, fast evolving and flexible world of cloud. And so the question is, does it perform? It's got, you know, it's got bits of Kubernetes managing it. How fast is it? And so they, these two graphs kind of show it. So what we've got is writing benchmarking over here, reading benchmarking over here. The blue line is the limitation of the network. So that is tops out at 600 gigabytes a second for all 24 servers in the um, data accelerator. The green line is what would happen if I ran a local file system benchmark and I just ran it on the node and wrote to the disk locally. So the green line is the fastest performance you can get locally. And this red piece, this is what we see from the application across the network asking for files rather than just blasting block data. So we get 
96% of the theoretical limitations of this system when we're writing to it. For reads, the uh, disk devices are a lot faster reading. So actually we get 84%, but that's 517 gigabytes a second delivered to one application. That's massive. In fact, this is so massive, it is the second highest I.O. performance in the world, which is pretty cool. Uh, the first is, I think it's Oak Ridge Lab. They have a machine. They have one of the big sort of Coral Grand Challenge machines. I forget what it was called. It will come back to me, but it's much bigger. Um, so there's a clear precedent for this, actually. We're not the first, and it's not really, it's not our idea to do this kind of approach. CERN have been doing this for years. So they have been combining cloud infrastructure with processing of physics, uh, physics workloads, particle physics workloads coming off the detector. And they've been doing it at a massive scale for ages. This is their tape robot. So each of these is a few terabytes of data. They have so much tape. I think they have 200 petabytes of tape in this thing. And what was interesting, I heard a good stat about it, is that um, the tape technology evolves every few years, and it takes them more time than the evolution of tape technology to read every tape in there. So the, the machine is permanently reading through old tapes, writing them out to new tapes of a more dense capacity, and then storing them back again. It's like the Tyne Bridge, or whichever it is. But um, So they, OpenStack is a huge thing at CERN. Everything that CERN does, pretty much, apart from the stuff right next to the big bits underground, is managed on OpenStack infrastructure. Those guys are great. And it's testament to the OpenStack community in that people like Cambridge University, CERN, other universities, other places, they aren't competitors with each other. They're actually getting on, they collaborate. There's a huge community out there for working together on scientific computing use cases for private cloud infrastructure using OpenStack infrastructure. Uh, it actually, it's probably one of the, the biggest use cases of OpenStack nowadays. The, the enterprise, the private cloud, the on-premise stuff, that's big, but this is pretty much as big as that. So we've kind of covered everything on this slide, which is uh, everything from the Big Bang, where CERN specializes, all the way out to where we are today, where we started to look at the radio astronomy, black holes, dark energy. We've covered the, the full range of what physics is about. And OpenStack appears to be playing a role in every single one of those. It's there. It's doing it. It's, it's providing these workloads. And it is essentially defining the future or the near future of how scientific computing is going to be done. But that's not everything. And uh, there's something else that's happened. There's probably an elephant in the room, or certainly something like it. What's coming next is this. So this is, well, you can see it, cost per genome, gene sequencing. So when we start to look at what's happening with DNA and what it is unlocking in terms of potential, we've just come down this thing. So the cost of it is going through the floor. And that means the usage of it is skyrocketing. And a really cool thing in this country, which we should really be more proud of and more aware of than we are and know about, is the Genomics England 100K Genome Project. And they just finished this. Uh, they just got their, their 100,000 100, uh, DNA samples um, late last year. And this data is going to be processed and is going to help bring together, coupled with patient records and other things for the people who are consenting to do that, um, it's going to help understand a huge amount about what our DNA is doing and what it means for us. And that project is going to need a bit of compute and it's going to need a bit of data. And this is an example of a machine or a project which is working closely as part of um, uh, Genomics England. This is one of the core processing engines of it. And it kind of looks like, you know, a stack that we might be familiar with. The names are a little bit different. Some of them are familiar. We've got Hadoop, MongoDB, 
Um, REST APIs, a whole bunch of um, different ways of talking to the thing. We've also got um, HVC clusters, and we've got all sorts of interesting optimized components to it, but also a lot of standard web tier kind of stuff, the, the stuff that uh, the kind of data retrieval work that um, cloud native industries do really well. So this is a really nice, interesting representation of how scientific computing or technical computing is kind of colliding with cloud native worlds and bringing out the best of both is where the, the art is uh, without taking out the worst as well. So there is still a bit of a problem and that is that these kinds of environments do break a lot of the assumptions that we make in cloud environments. We kind of assume in cloud that there, we've got like a our supported users are like individuals and they all do individual things and they do them when they do them and they scale up and scale down you know when they need to and and the kind of the whole the whole sneaky game of it is not everyone does this at once which is exactly the opposite of what happens in scientific computing world in which the cloud could have one user and that user could provision every hypervisor in the cloud at the same time with one image and how do we do this on infrastructure which is kind of geared for the opposite and, is, and depends on the assumption of the opposite of that where we don't expect everyone to deploy the same image at the same time and, um, and get to the other end of it successfully. So these are, these are the challenges, these are the use cases where cloud scientific computing and, and sort of cloud native models of computing don't really fit together. They do but they, they, it breaks all the assumptions. So we have to reverse those assumptions. We have to pull them apart. We have to understand where things are going wrong and then just reconfigure the way that the cloud is working underneath these uh, workloads in order to make it work. And that's kind of where this concept about sort of a scientific form or flavor or formulation of OpenStack comes in. And this is the kind of thing that my company and a bunch of other people across the world are working on right now. And it's happening here in Bristol. Well, not here, but in, nearby in Bristol. We can see it. Making its own microprocessors. It's a city that has, I mean, along with Newport, obviously, it, and through the creation of Inmos, it's been solving difficult problems like this without realizing that people think they're difficult uh, for 40 years. Uh, this guy, Ian Barron, is the, um, the founder of Inmos, the, um, the silicon company that started the whole thing going. And um, I saw a talk by him recently, and he said, uh, it was quite simple, he says. I, um, I found lots of bright young people, and I gave them impossible tasks, and I didn't tell them it was impossible. And that's what happened. And, um, and therefore, they created things like um, computer automated uh, design for silicon, and um, uh, CAD tools and other things, and um, they made these incredible lineage of... Um, achievements technically and there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to carry on doing this so I got a last soapbox moment which is that really we don't need to be really beholden to other people selling us our cloud services we can make it ourselves it's quite easy actually and it's kind of fun so um, um, amazing things can be achieved with cloud native tools and we can do these things and the scientific world out there needs those kind of things. There are huge and difficult unsolved problems which can be at least helped by applying the things that are evolving and emerging from the cloud native world. Um, software defined supercomputers are pretty cool, but I expect everyone here is working on equivalent complexity, equivalent scale kind of things, which are also pretty cool. But um, so actually, it's we shouldn't stop believing in what we can do with this infrastructure because when we apply it to challenges like this, we just need to find the good challenges in order to stimulate our imagination. And um, anyone else, I wanted to do another little plug, which is um, anyone else who's interested in OpenStack and open infrastructure and making it yourself, there's uh, the Open Infra Days in London on the 1st of April. Um, 
which will be really good and I'll see you there if you're going. So thank you very much. <laughs>